but really addressing the fact that we had heard earlier today from President Putin of Russia that he thought that things were progressing in the talks with Ukraine. And also, of course, President Biden coming out with further sanctions, including changing the trade status of Russia. We turn now to a veteran U.S. diplomat. He is Robert Zellick, principal of the Brunswick Group. He served as president of the World Bank. He served as U.S. trade representative and as deputy secretary of state. So, Bob, thank you so much for being with us. You heard a fair amount of that. You're a veteran of these sorts of discussions, uh, including at the side of Jim Baker, the famous secretary of state. How do you discern when really there is progress being made, as President Putin said today there is, as opposed to mere posturing? Well, you know, like probably all your listeners, you just have to start with an extraordinary admiration for the foreign minister and the people fighting on the ground in Ukraine. And when you talk about progress, you know, diplomacy also has to be linked to the, the use of force. And there'd be no chance for diplomacy if the Ukrainians weren't fighting heroically as they have been. Having said that, I think the danger is, is that Putin's going to double down, as CIA Director Bill Burns said. You know, he, his belief in this is that Ukraine should not exist as a sovereign state. He sees this as his case of his place in Russian history and Russian history. So we've got bloody and difficult days ahead. Uh, and the question will be whether the United States, Europe, and others can try to maneuver some of the other players to put pressure on Putin diplomatically, along with events on the ground, to try to at least get a ceasefire. And what's been tried so far, which is extensive, I think most people agree that these sanctions are wider and deeper than anything we've ever seen before, doesn't seem to have had much effect on President Putin. When you talk about others, you have a piece on the Bloomberg right now suggesting an other could be China. What is the possible constructive role China might play here? So, so first, a word on the sanctions, David. You know, look, these have been powerful and they're extensive, but they're going to operate on a different time frame. Um, and, you know, the reality is, as the Ukrainian minister said, it, it's not only a question of economics, it's now a question of reputation for a lot of these, these companies. And I think it's going to devastate Russia's economy, but not necessarily in time to get Putin uh, to stop now. So the piece that, that, that you mentioned uh, was trying to put the finger on China. Uh, the Chinese-Russian relationship has been very close. The putin Z relationship is personally close. Uh, the Chinese have talked about no limits to the nature of that relationship. Um, but if you ask yourself, how does this serve China's interests, you kind of come up with a big question mark. Uh, Putin or Xi is looking at his party Congress in 2022, later this year. Why would he want to have high energy and food prices and economic instability? He's concerned about Taiwan and breakaway territory. So why would he want to support Russia's uh, idea of breaking away territory? We know he doesn't like NATO and the alliance, but all these actions are just strengthening NATO and the alliance. So I think the bigger picture here is the Chinese have said they don't want a new Cold War, but they're pushing the world towards it because they're not differentiating themselves from Russia. Now, how do you change that? Well, look, from the Chinese point of view, trying to put yourself in their shoes, they believe that after four years of Trump and the year of Biden, that the United States cannot accept China's rise. They don't see the United States as giving them uh, any room. And there's some things the U.S. might try to do to do that, recognizing it's a long shot. But I think on the diplomatic side, Europe may be in a critical position here because the Chinese do not want to have Europe sort of become hostile to them over time. The pictures in Europe, the, the refugees, the destruction of European security, the moves in Germany, which are startling, these create a new opportunity. And so my argument is that the Europeans should pick up on this idea that the Chinese have talked about a mediation, not let the Chinese do it by themselves. But if Ukraine is willing to have the European Union, as well as China, try to push for a ceasefire to start, and then beyond a ceasefire, see whether some of the things that President Zelensky has talked about might create the basis of a deal. It's not this by any means a, 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 a great probability, but my worry is if we don't, we're going to see ongoing sieges and destructions of Ukraine, which serves no one's interests. And thus far, we've seen a China, and these are my words, not yours, almost sitting on the fence. Uh, they haven't gone as far as they might either way. They seem to be right in the middle, perhaps, uh, is what can be done by the United States and or the EU to get them off the fence, if I'm correct, that's where they are? 
No, I think you're exactly correct. I mean, they they look, they don't want to directly support uh, uh, the Russians because they traditionally support sovereignty and independence. They don't want to alienate everybody's relations. But they're being extremely cautious and they don't want to do anything to undermine Putin. And there's some reports about sort of deeper degrees of support. And so the start is to make sure that the US, Europe, and others around the world point out that China will be responsible. It is taking uh, its support of Putin as these poor people get slaughtered, that they have to face up to that issue. But then also in diplomacy, you have to offer the incentives. And so if China can, in a sense, differentiate itself from Russia, play a mediating role in a way that helps bring at least uh, some ceasefire, if not peace, that's a plus for China. How does this look from President Xi's point of view? You, you, you're, you've dealt with China for many years now. You understand it terribly well. Uh, obviously, we're very concerned about Ukraine. We're concerned about Western Europe. We're concerned with Russia. But from President Xi's point of view, what are the biggest concerns he has? I mean, I know he's coming up for his third term, count him third term later this year. Uh, how does this read perhaps against the leadership position in China? Well, I think he's in a very strong position. He, he centralized control, uh, frankly, to a degree, as in, in Russia, there's a problem of, of channels of information, perhaps being closed off, also being harder with the pandemic. But I think the big picture here is that he, like Putin, has this view about NATO and the Western alliances closing in on Russia and China. And that's the core problem here, is that they, they whether we agree with it or not, they feel that what is happening with Russia could happen to them. And so as they as we apply these broad-based sanctions, they will certainly calculate how will it apply to them. If they think someday about action with Taiwan, they will also calculate it. So you asked about sort of what contributed to this. Look, I, I think this is primarily on China's shoulders, but to be fair, you know, the United States just talked about launching a new series of trade investigations after the Trump trade deal didn't work. I'm not sure the timing of that was the smartest thing to do if it's going to suggest raising barriers. We sent a delegation of former officials, a number of my friends who I respect, to go to Taiwan. And I think it's important to reassure Taiwan. I'm not sure I would have done that right now. So what I'm trying to emphasize is, look, diplomacy is never a sure thing. It's trying ideas and see if they can try to work. And in this environment, the longer this war goes on, the worse it looks for China the more that the relationship with Putin becomes kind of a, a, a stone around China's neck, and the more that the world realizes that, that China bears a responsibility here, China wants to be a great power. If so, it has to try to act with some sense of responsibility. I think the U.S. could help in this, but frankly, over the past year, really over the past five years, our diplomatic ties to have the type of discussions I've just outlined for you have been pretty damn limited. So I honestly think this is going to be important for the EU. So you had, for example, the president of, of France and the chancellor of Germany have a discussion with Xi. Why not have another call that says, why don't we mediate this together? Why don't we call it out together? And our first goal will be a ceasefire. President Zelensky has talked about uh, giving up the idea of applying for NATO and, and uh, moving to a more neutral position. That certainly should be a basis uh, for people to work on these issues. So ultimately, these decisions will have to be made by the Ukrainians and by the Russians. But mediation might create an environment for people to have an exit. It's a fascinating idea. I really appreciate you being here to share it with us. That is Bob Zellick of the Brunswick Group. And now we want to go to the White House and Jared Bernstein of the Council of Economic Advisors. Jared, thank you so much for joining us. We heard from President Biden earlier today on further sanctions with respect to Russia and one in particular, the trade status of Russia. Give us a sense of what that's likely to do to Russia. And by the way, could it have blowback on our own economy as well? Uh, thanks. And always great to talk to you. Uh, the president talked about revoking PNTR, most favored nation status for Russian trade. Obviously, uh, we've already banned uh, energy imports. This goes further. And once again, and you heard the president uh, discuss this, uh, these bans are coordinated with our allies. 
and the broader they go, the more impact they have on Russia's economy, which is already massively stumbling under the pressure of these sanctions. So this is more of that sort of pressure, uh, again, jointly with our allies. And listen, we just talked to Bob Zelik about it. These are extraordinary sanctions, the likes of which most of us have never seen before in our lives, maybe have never had it in history. And so it's no question it's affecting Russia. But what about our economy, the United States economy, the sure. Western economy for that matter? Uh, we're looking at the possibility of reduced growth and perhaps even higher inflation. Well, certainly from uh, energy, you've heard the president lean into this uh, uh, Putin price hike on, uh, on energy and on oil. I mean, even in February's CPI report that came out yesterday, towards the end of the month, uh, we saw uh, West Texas Intermediate begin to uh, climb up quite steeply. And in fact, a third of the 0.8 percent increase came from energy yesterday. So Putin's price hike is very much embedded in, in the February and will be even more so in the March numbers. However, however, and this is key for our listeners, uh, this president does not just uh, sit, sit here and watch these uh, developments occur. He has dispatched his team. He is working internationally to do everything we can to help the American consumers deal with those energy pressures. Uh, one of the most uh, probably important and quick-acting near-term uh, interventions is, of course, the release of oil from the strategic reserves. We've uh, visited that uh, solution before. We're going to do so again. Uh, but there's a lot more to it than that. When it comes to non-oil imports, we're, we're considerably less exposed there uh, than some of our allies. But on the energy side, uh, we're very actively uh, trying to help ease prices for consumers. So, Dr. Bernstein, staying with energy then for a moment, because that's the, the biggest issue, uh, what about other alternatives if it increased supply? And, and for that, I specifically look at Saudi Arabia and the possibility of getting them to pump more, more, and also Iran. I understand those talks have been suspended. There was some thought that maybe we could get sort of an agreement with Iran. It would increase production. I think we have to think on a near and a longer term uh, scope here. In the near term, uh, precisely as you've said, you've heard the president say all options are on the table. I talked about uh, the release of oil from strategic reserves, again, an internationally coordinated move. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, we are working with uh, oil producing countries to, to kick up the supply. But look, I think that o over the longer term, uh, it should be absolutely clear to anyone that uh, freedom-loving countries have to free ourselves from, from the bloody grasp of this uh, brutal plutocrat uh, and his fossil fuels. And the way forward on that is, of course, the president's uh, climate agenda moving towards, and again, I'm being very clear, this is a medium and longer term solution uh, moving uh, towards less dependence on fossil fuels. And of course, uh, we have, we've had since we've been here, an elaborate and detailed path to get there. Uh, from your point of view, Dr. Bernstein, has the energy policy shifted from the Biden administration in response to this crisis, or is it pretty much the way it was? Are we moving faster away from fossil fuels? I wouldn't say that it's shifted as much as it's, it's really clarified that as we transition uh, to a, an economy that's much more, uh, it, uh, that, that uses much more renewables to supply its energy, that as we uh, move through that transition, we have to make sure that we're bringing the consumer along with us. We, we can't uh, be in a world where, where people are facing, you know, inflation that's 8, 9, 10 percent. So uh, obviously uh, we have to walk and chew gum here. And what that means is doing everything we can in the near term uh, to ensure uh, that uh, prices are, are eased uh, at, at the pump and elsewhere. You know, the president's agenda goes well beyond energy. Uh, prescription drugs, uh, health care, child care, elder care, uh, all of that is, is on the legislative table. Uh, but right now, sure, we're focused on near-term energy relief, uh, uh, quit most quickly through uh, um, the uh, uh, strategic reserves, uh, working with uh, oil producing countries longer term, yes, hastening the path towards, uh, towards a greener production. Jared, always appreciate you taking the time to spend with us. That's Dr. Jared Bernstein of the Council of Economic Advisors coming to us from the White House. Still to come, we're going to talk with Rohit Chopra. He is director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
Russia invades Ukraine. We have proven our strength. The nature of this war changed yesterday. Turn to Bloomberg for up to the minute reporting from around the world. Ground troops are closing in on the Ukrainian capital. Swiss abandon neutrality. And analysis of what it all means to you. Energy is on the table. We can see all prices moving closer to 120. There is a lot of interest to offload Russian assets. Look to see more companies announce their exits from Russia. Keep it tuned to Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We always want to keep one eye on the markets and how they are reacting to some of the geopolitical issues that we cover here. We just talked, actually, with Jared Bernstein from the White House about the energy situation. And oil certainly is at the top of the list that's really been affected by this crisis in Ukraine. And to give us a report on where we are right now, we turn now to Kriti Gupta. So welcome back from Sarah down in uh, Houston. Thank you. Yeah, you know what? It was fantastic to get that opportunity to report from Houston because there's so many sides to this story, right? We have these Russian barrels that some people are seeing as completely off the market given the sanctions that you're seeing from Canada, from the United States, from the United Kingdom. But then if you look abroad and you speak to, say, OPEC officials, they'll say, well, there's no actual physical shortage in the market. Those Russian barrels are still very much on the market. You just have certain countries that aren't willing to accept them. So then the spotlight kind of comes on who fills that dearth of supply or perceived supply, as some people are saying. And that's really where the spotlight falls on the energy sector and this kind of disconnect between the Biden administration and the shale sector. Well, a, little, a lot of finger pointing, I think I've seen, where the Biden administration yeah. says, you have all the permits you need. It's up to you. Just keep pumping. Get, get, get pumping again. And the interest is, no, 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 no. There's all kinds of barriers between here and there because you've tried to shut us down. Yeah, there are a lot of barriers. I mean, you know, we caught up with some of the major CEOs, uh, Ryan Lance over at ConocoPhillips, Vicki Hall at Occidental, and they said those supply chain issues, those labor shortages, you're hearing about all the other sectors, they apply to the energy sector as well. And it's important to keep in mind as well that this is onshore drilling. This is not offshore drilling where you can kind of turn it on and turn it off. There is an amount of investment that creates a lag in terms of getting that supply. And really that lag right now is at about a year. Yeah. And are you another, willing to bet? And there's another set of parties that have a say on that, and it's the shareholders of those companies. Right. Because it wasn't that long ago they were saying, please don't invest it in the ground. We'd like the money, please, in dividends and stock buybacks. Right. And that's why you're seeing such a slow ramp up. Remember, they're still dealing with the kind of fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. And they're saying, if we're going to invest, we have to be sure that yeah. those prices are going to be high for that one year it takes to invest. If you start to see a crash, that's an investment gone south. Pretty hard to be sure in oil right now. Thank you so much to Kriti Gupta. Coming up, we're going to talk with Rohit Chopra. He's director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Uh, yesterday, I met with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, in Antalya. This meeting was facilitated by the Turkish Foreign Minister. We spent an hour and a half, and uh, there was zero progress in talks. So it's hard for me to understand what kind of progress President Putin is referring to. So there, from what your side is saying, there have been no positive movements at all? Well, I see that the Russian army is still in Ukraine. They, they continue destroying our cities, killing our children, civilians. And uh, it speaks for one fact only, that uh, even if uh, we continue talking with Russia, uh, that does not have uh, an impact on uh, the behavior of uh, the Russian army on the ground. That was Ukrainian Foreign Affairs Minister Dmitro Kuleba speaking with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern just about a half an hour ago now. So Anne-Marie joins us from Washington. First of all, congratulations. It was a fascinating interview. Tell me what really you took away from that interview that you learned from it, Anne-Marie. Thanks, David. Well, I think this morning there was this exuberance, definitely in the financial markets, and also a lot of journalists asking questions, because President Putin had said that there was these positive developments in the talks, and we had yet to hear from the Ukrainians if, if they agreed with that statement. And it was very obvious from this interview that that is just not where the discussions are at this moment. He said, quote, zero progress right now in those talks. And it's very hard to see how there could be progress when you still have shelling going on in Ukraine. Ukraine overnight, some of that shelling even moving to the West. So right now it does seem like this diplomatic path forward is really not matching up with the words. And I think the one thing we should all take away from, uh, especially given the fact if you see the um, 
the how President Putin has really led the country over the past 20 years or so, it's that we should look at his actions always less so as what he says. Yeah, absolutely right. The other thing that struck me, Anne-Marie, listening to the interview was when you asked what more can the West and the United States and others do to support? And he had two things. One is tighten up the existing sanctions. He talked to companies doing business, continue to do business in Russia and talked about blood profits. And also, of course, he really wants those MiG-29 fighter planes. Yes. Yeah, so these are the these are the two big things Ukrainians continuously push for. I mean, we have a fantastic piece on the Bloomberg today about how President Zelensky had called the CEO of Visa. There have been personal pleas from the Ukrainian government to talk to executives and Western business leaders to say, please, Come out of Russia, halt your business ties, because this is the only way we can get President Putin's attention. And then, of course, when it comes to those fighter jets, he really outlined why they need them so desperately, because he says whoever controls the skies controls what's going on on the ground. And right now, David, it is an incredibly tragic humanitarian issue as well in Ukraine. About 2.5 million Ukrainians, I believe, is what the U.N. has it right now, have fled. And then you have another 2 million within the country who have, all, have been displaced. Yeah, such a tragedy. Thank you so much for bringing us that interview and for being with us here today. That's our Washington correspondent, Anne-Marie Hordern. We're going to move now from Ukraine back to the United States and the effects of inflation, but also the war to some extent, on what's happening here in our economy. We welcome now Rohit Chopra. Chopra, he is director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So, Rohit, thank you so much for being here. There's a lot that's going on in our economy right now with inflation. One of the things we're seeing is car prices, car prices going through the roof, used cars as well as new cars. How does that affect your business and the sorts of loans that are being made and how people are collecting on them? Well, look, regulators are looking closer at all the components of inflation, and autos is a big part of it. It's new cars, it's used cars, it's everything. We're projecting that the $1.4 trillion auto lending market is going to grow, balances are going to get higher, and that's going to put more strain on families. It's one of the biggest places I think inflation is going to be hitting people. It's strained, but in my experience, in general in life, when there's a lot of money sloshing around, there are abuses. Are we seeing people taking advantage from the point of view of lending and sellers taking advantage of this tight market? Well, we're not seeing that yet, but we're on the lookout, especially for repossession activity. Here's why. Usually, lenders don't really want to repossess. They want to work out with borrowers. But here's what's happening. They can actually take the car and they can sell it sometimes above Kelly Blue Book value. That fundamentally changes the incentives. And it's why we have issued some bulletins and enforcement orders to make sure that there are not illegal repossessions. No one wants to wake up to see their car stolen. One of the big issues in the, in the campaign has been in the country for a while now is student loans. Uh, where is the CFPB on student loans? What are you doing about them? Well, we're all waiting for a decision on what's going to happen long term. As of right now, payments are going to restart for over 40 million borrowers. I think at a time of inflation, it's going to put more pressure on a lot of individual families. They're not just young, they're older too. But we want to make sure that those loan servicers, the companies that collect the payments, are not deceiving borrowers about how they can avoid default. The last thing we need is a spiral of defaults, which will make the recovery even tougher. Last week, as you know so well, President Biden issued an executive order dealing with cryptocurrency regulation and assigning some responsibilities to some of the agencies, setting a timeline. Uh, where are you, CFPB, uh, in the crypto regulation hunt? Well, you know, most of crypto right now is for speculative trading purposes. It's mostly financial instruments. But look, here's what may happen over time. As soon as crypto expands and goes to families, to consumers, we think it's probably going to happen, if it happens, by riding the rails of some of the big tech companies or some of the other big players. We have issued a set of orders to Apple, Google, Facebook, and others to tell us what they're doing when it comes to digital currencies. But also, we're going to be working with the other regulators to figure out how do we make sure that consumers are protected, no matter if they're using cash, credit cards, debit cards, or virtual currencies. There was a report on the Bloomberg uh, about uh, refinancing of homes, specifically mentioning Wells Fargo putting up some statistics that, uh, frankly, black borrowers were not getting refinanced through this crisis period at the same rate as uh, Caucasian bor borrows. Uh, what do you know about that? Well, look, a low interest rate environment, in theory, 
is supposed to help homeowners a lot. They can take advantage of refinancing and save money every single month. But when borrowers miss out on that because they're redlined or illegally redlined, that's a big problem. We have really amped up our focus on fair lending and anti-redlining efforts. I don't want to comment specifically about Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo obviously has a record when it comes to some run-ins with the CFPB and regulators, but uh, we're very committed to make sure that we root out redlining wherever we can and, and that there's serious sanctions when it occurs. Uh, another big issue in this country you know so well is medical bills. And, and part of the issue is surprise medical bills, where you run it up and then all of a sudden you're shocked with this huge bill you get at the end. I understand that there's some linkage between that and uh, consumer credit scores. Yes. Yeah, so what we recently released a study on was that there are 43 million Americans who have unpaid, allegedly unpaid medical bills on their credit report. We're very concerned that the credit reporting system has become a tool of coercion mm -hmm. to collect bills that people may not even owe. Many of us have personally experienced about being in a doom loop between the insurance company, the hospital, and the consumer is caught in the middle. And then at a certain point they say, we're gonna put it on your credit report. That has real consequences. That makes it tougher sometimes to pass an employment verification check, to be able to rent a home or to get credit. So we are very concerned and are evaluating whether it's even appropriate for unpaid medical bills to be on credit reports. We've gone over several issues on your agenda here, and thank you for going through so many of them. But let me put you on the spot. If you had to pick the number one item on your agenda, when you talk to your staff, what's the number one thing you're pursuing right now where you're devoting your resources? Well, to me, I'm always going to be laser focused on housing and mortgages. Mm -hmm. We know how devastating it can be when there's illegal foreclosures, the ripple effects on the economy. And the truth is, is if we don't have a fair system of mortgages and a system where people can get credit to buy a home, it's just not the America that we want to have. So that will always be such a key piece of every single family's economic life. So we will not be looking away from that. It was really good having you here. Thank you so much for coming in today. That's Rohit Chopar. He is the director of the Consumer Financial Consumer Financial Protection, Protection Bureau. Bureau. Thank you. Uh, coming up, we'll hear from the former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We want to keep you up to date with news from around the world. And for that, we turn to Mark Crumpton with First Word. David, thank you. President Biden is laying out plans that he says will give a, quote, crushing blow to the Russian economy. Speaking at the White House this morning, the president called for an end to normal trade relations with Russia, clearing the way for increased import tariffs. He also announced a ban on Russian-made vodka and caviar. Putin is an aggressor. He is the aggressor. Putin must pay the price. He cannot pursue a war that threatens the very foundations, which he's doing, the very foundations of international peace and stability, and then ask for financial help from the international community. If Congress passes the legislation, Russia would join Cuba and North Korea as the only countries without the status. Former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown wants an international tribunal established to prosecute Russian President Vladimir Putin for his alleged war crimes in Ukraine. Mr. Brown spoke with Bloomberg Television this morning. He faces uh, uh, the scrutiny of the world, but also the punishment of the world if he continues with, with, with what is a straightforward crime, the crime of aggression. He has invaded Ukraine. That is a crime in international law and we need to find a way of prosecuting that. And Prime Minister Brown added that a tribunal would also send a message to President Putin and his inner circle that their brutal criminality will not escape trial and punishment. And he said it would sow fear among Mr. Putin's inner circle, if not President Putin himself. World powers and Iran suspended their efforts to revive that landmark 2015 nuclear accord. That's reigniting a crisis that's likely to lead to a spike in oil prices. 
and in Persian Gulf tensions. A top EU diplomat says negotiators have failed to bridge major differences. The two sides had been close to salvaging the agreement. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, the problems that we are facing may sometimes seem daunting. And when I spoke with former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers earlier today about what we need from Washington, he said he hopes we'll find the seriousness required to deal with them. I think it's a time for what I like to call a new seriousness. It's a seriousness made necessary by the gravity of the threats we are now seeing especially with the potentially emerging axis between uh, China and uh, Russia. Whether the issue is coming together to maintain America's technological leadership, whether it is recognizing that the quality of our education system is central to the kind of leadership that we have been able to provide in uh, the world, whether the seriousness is over repairing our infrastructure. You know, it was a national security concern that drove Dwight Eisenhower to uh, the interstate highway system. It was concerns about the power of the American example that drove uh, the Civil Rights uh, act in important uh, respects. We need to move beyond partisan uh, bickering and move beyond excuse uh, mongering to ask about the fundamental systems of the economy and how they can be made uh, to work better. And that means both and thinking rather than either or. Uh, thinking. We have common adversaries in China and in uh, Russia where we need to stand up. We have adversaries at home in extremism and radical populists who want to tear down a system that has made this the greatest nation in uh, the history of the world. And we need to come together. It's not about doing hits on uh, TV. It's not about doing an event for a constituency. This is a moment of major challenge that deserves major response from our nation's leadership. That was Larry Summers, former U.S. Treasury Secretary. We're going to hear more from Larry tonight on Wall Street Week at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Coming up here, Melinda Herring of the Atlantic Council on the prospects for a negotiated settlement of the crisis in Ukraine. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. There's been a flurry of talk on the diplomatic front surrounding Ukraine today, with President Putin saying talks are progressing, and then the Ukrainian foreign minister telling Bloomberg just a very short time ago that talk was not leading to changes on the ground in his country. For her perspective on what is happening, we turn now to Melinda Herring. She is deputy director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. So thank you so much for being with us. Give us your take on what we're hearing and whether it could lead to something that would change the facts on the ground. Hey, David, it's a nothing burger. Vladimir Putin is lying yet again. So anything that comes out of his mouth needs to be fact-checked. There is no progress on the diplomatic situation, unfortunately. What could give rise to some progress? There would need to be a lot to change Vladimir Putin's mind. Right now, he thinks he's in the catbird seat and he is determined to destroy Ukraine. And, you know, there's been a lot of reporting that Ukraine is doing well, which is true. They're doing much, much better than we expected. But Vladimir Putin is slowly but surely eating away at southeastern Ukraine. They're doing quite well in the north. The situation is, uh, you know, it, we, we have to keep watching this. We're only two weeks in. Russia has not done as well as we expected. Uh, but they have taken Kherson. 
And, you know, the, the Ukrainians have fought very valiantly. And I think the big story that we all missed, and I, I'm, I'm going to put myself in this category, we overestimated the strength of the Russian military and underestimated the strength of the Ukrainian side. At the same time, there's a race against the clock here. Uh, we have uh, really sweeping sanctions that get ratcheted up pretty much every day. And uh, to some people, a surprising degree of unanimity among those imposing the sanctions. But those take a while. In the meantime, uh, war can move very much faster. David, the sanctions are actually really starting to bite, but they're starting to bite middle-class Russians. Middle-class Russians don't like them. They can't travel. They can't use their visa cards. They can't get out of Russia. And they're, I mean, they're in Vladimir Putin's Russia that's becoming increasingly isolated. It's starting to feel like North Korea, but, you know, a much bigger country. Uh, the joke there is we don't want to drive Volgas. And even if we drove a Volga, we can't get the parts that we need because they come from Germany. So people are very frustrated uh, with the sanctions. They are starting to bite. People are definitely feeling it. But I'm not sure that we're our, our, our plan makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, we want middle-class Russians to be on our side. We don't want to impoverish middle-class Russians. So I'm not sure what the strategy is, to be very frank. For our television audience, we've been showing some of President Biden speaking. He's speaking at that Philadelphia gathering of the Democrats. We'll bring you any headlines as they develop. In the meantime, Melinda, could we get some help from some others? We had Bob Zellick, the former Deputy Secretary of State on, former President of the World Bank, earlier in this program, who said China could play a very constructive role here, and it should see it as in its best interest to try to make this conflict go away. Yeah, so uh, you had Larry Summers on there earlier, too, and he was saying that China and Russia are on the same page, and that's not true. So, yes, she and Putin are on the same page. They give each other necklaces. There's a great bromance. But if you go a little bit deeper, the, 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 the links between Russia and China are not as strong as you might suspect. Yes, they're both authoritarian. Yes, they don't like the West. Yes, they have great ambitions. But that's about where the, the, the similarities end. China just said it's not going to supply parts for, for, for Russia, and that's a big deal. So let's hope we see more of that from China. Uh, look, I think China's going to play a double-faced game. Uh, you know, they, they um, are close to Russia, but they also know you can't look at what's happening in Mariupol in southeastern Ukraine, where the Russians just bombed a maternity wing. And you, you can't be human and not find that disgusting. So I think the Chinese are going to play a double game, and let's encourage them to do more. Uh, to, to, to block the, the Russian action there. Uh, so how does this play out? How, do, how, how does this end? It's yes. going to take a long time. I'm so sorry to say. So we've been at this for two weeks, and it's going. the Russians are going to do what they did in Grozny, Chechnya, back in the 2000s. There's going to be indiscriminate bombing, and millions of civilians are going to be killed. 2.2 million Ukrainians have already fled to the European Union. And, and David, we don't know how many internally displaced people are. That means people from eastern Ukraine, from Kiev, who are who have moved to safety in western Ukraine. We don't have a good number. There's a dire humanitarian situation in that town I was talking about in Mariupol. People are boiling snow because they don't have drinking water. They don't have electricity. They don't have food. And, and only the Red Cross is there. Last one. How do you assess the risk that this actually could spread beyond Ukraine? We're very concerned about that eastern flank of NATO. It's not going to happen. Vladimir Putin is not going to take on NATO. He's already getting his butt kicked in Ukraine. He expected to roll into Ukraine and take Kiev in a matter of days, and it's been two weeks. There's no way he's going to take on NATO. Yeah, it has been a surprise to much of the world. Thank you so much. Really great to have you with us. That's Melinda Herring. She's deputy director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. President Biden is delivering remarks right now, as I said, to the House Democratic Caucus in Philadelphia. You can follow that coverage on the terminal on Live Go. Coming up here, Balance of Power is going to continue on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we will talk with Congressman Brian Stile about the new trade status that President Biden is proposing for Russia, what effects that might have. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.